Ethics also on the agenda in the United States, where a devastating report has found that Southern Baptist Convention leaders mishandled sexual abuse allegations over two decades. Survivors were ignored, disbelieved, and even intimidated, the report says. The Protestant denomination has an estimated 14 million members. Russell Moore is former president of the Ethics Commission for the convention. He resigned a year ago over what he felt was an inadequate response to many of the allegations of sexual abuse. But the report's findings have still surprised him as he tells Michelle Martin. Thanks, Christian. Pastor Russell Moore, thank you so much for joining us once again. Thanks for having me. The reason we're talking today is that the Southern Baptist Convention released the findings of a year-long investigation by an, a third-party professional investigating firm uh, looking at allegations of sexual abuse, or at least the way the convention addressed matters of sexual misconduct, of abuse, of harassment, of assault going back for 20 years. Frankly, the findings are deeply disturbing uh, to anybody, I would think, reading them. How did they strike you? Well, I expected to be the last person to be surprised uh, by the investigation because uh, I was the, the one who called for uh, an investigation to take place. And, and I thought, well, everyone else should see what's going on here and make decisions. But even I was shocked by the, the depths of it. I mean, the, this, this investigation revealed things that were, uh, were so horrifying and, and shocking that I, I don't know how any functioning conscience could not withdraw in horror from some of it. For people who haven't read it, what were some of the findings that stood out to you? Well, uh, one of the findings that was uh, most shocking to me after years and years of, of several of us saying, how, how can we uh, work towards some sort of database that could prevent uh, pastors or staff members or others who are abusers moving from one church to the other and being told by the executive committee couldn't be done, we've looked into it legally, it can't happen, there's no way to know these things. There actually was a secret shadow database in the executive committee with what the report says uh, could be up to over 700 uh, individuals involved in, in this kind of abuse uh, collated there, not to protect uh, sexual abuse victims, but to protect themselves. That was uh, startling to me. Uh, also, when you look through and you see, as somebody who experienced the obstacles uh, from the executive committee in addressing these, these matters, uh, even at the point of just calling them a crisis, uh, that, was, uh, that was objected to repeatedly. Um, when you look at the back and forth, it's in black and white print, the conversations that were going on internally. The sort of dismissiveness toward uh, sexual abuse uh, victims and survivors, the, the inhumanity there it, it is, it is horrifying. Let me read from the executive summary. It says that, that for almost two decades, survivors of abuse and other concerned Southern Baptists have been contacting the SBC Executive Committee to report child molesters and other abusers who were in the pulpit or employed as church staff. They made phone calls, mailed letters, sent emails, appeared at SBC and EC Executive Committee meetings, held rallies, contacted the press, only to be met time and time again with resistance, stonewalling, and even outright hostility from yes. some within the executive committee. And by outright hostility, I mean like they were vilified. These yes. were, let me just say religiously, as a pastor, as a person who's ordained, as a person who's committed to carrying the word of your faith, how do you understand that? Well, there was something going on there that was the work of the devil, but it wasn't uh, that of the, the sexual abuse victims and survivors. It, it was these conversations that would, that would picture them as crazy or as evil. And, and frankly, uh, the least surprising thing to me in this report is the way that uh, sexual abuse uh, instances were spoken of as a distraction. Uh, because that was that was something many of us encountered over and over and over again. We can't get distracted from the mission, from what it is that that we're called to do. Well, the the most the most basic and minimal level of our mission is to have safety for kids and for vulnerable people that Jesus tells us He loves. I mean that, that that's that's not uh, some sort of extra. Uh, that that uh, any institution has to do. That's basic and fundamental, especially when it's happening in the name of Jesus. 
one of the other disturbing things about the report is that people at the highest levels, some of the most revered leaders within the organization, were implicated in this conduct, not just as covering it up, but also actively participating in it themselves. Yes. And I have to ask you, did you see that? I, I was not surprised by some of the uh, cases that were, were collated because those were things that had been reported uh, previously, but there were several that were indeed shocking. Uh, there, was, uh, there was one uh, minister mentioned, he was one of the very few people who seems to be or seemed to be respected across all of the typical divisions and camps. And that one was uh, that one was quite a shock. And there are many people that I talk to right now who are still reeling from that uh, from that set of revelations. Pastor Moore, you wrote about this in a very um, powerful and obviously deeply felt um, essay for Christianity Today. You write, who cannot now see the rot in a culture that mobilizes to exile churches that call a woman on staff a pastor or that invite a woman to speak from the pulpit on Mother's Day, but dismisses rape and molestation as distractions and efforts to address them as violations of cherished church autonomy. In sectors of today's SBC Southern Baptist Convention, women wearing leggings is a social media crisis. Dealing with rape in the church is a distraction. How do you understand this within the structure of the Southern Baptist community that this went on for so long? Frankly, I will say to you that there are people who identify as evangelical, who identify as belonging to the religious tradition, if not the specific group, who say that really it's related to the kind of misogyny and that deeply rooted patriarchy within the church that basically says that men are more important than women, that men I have all power and women don't. Could it be that? Yeah. Yes, I think that's a key a part of it, a, an attitude toward uh, women that is um, that is unbiblical and is is wrong. We we would see that when uh, sexual abuse survivors or victims would be spoken of uh, behind closed doors as Jezebel's or as uh, Potiphar's wife, uh, an, an example that's that's not relevant at all from from scripture against these uh, brave and courageous women who are coming forward that that sort of language you combine that with in some sectors there was a sense that well these are these are fake issues the the me too movement that's something out there in the culture that's a that's a liberal idea it, it's not something that's that was really relevant to us uh, along with institutional self-protection uh, which is one of the things that we have seen over and over and over again in multiple institutions where the institution itself becomes an idol and becomes more important than innocent people. We are talking about people who as children or as very young, as young girls were brought into sexual relationships with people that could be damaging lifelong. I mean, they, there was first person testimony about this people survivors have spoken publicly about this these are people who are committed to the church yep. and so i guess what i'm wondering since you know these people some of the people implicated in this report i'm just i'm just wondering did how do you see that is it that they feel they're just more important or I, i'm just do you understand what i'm asking here yes it's a it's a deep darkness um and and that's one of the reasons why I, when people ask me, well, what should be done in terms of structural reforms? There are a lot of structural reforms that need to happen. Uh, the, the SBC Executive Committee itself is far too powerful, and its power happens uh, mostly behind closed doors. There are databases. There are things that can be done. But that's not enough. Uh, what has to happen is to, to also get at the root of, of where is this coming from, and it is deeply, deeply dark. And that's one of the reasons why uh, some several of us uh, were, were told, well, you need to work within the system and, and do things according to the, the process that's there. Well, well, all of us did. I mean, I, I've been, I was working within the process for 50 years as a uh, loyal Southern Baptist from the moment I was conceived. And, uh, and eventually one gets to the point of saying, wait, this is this is deeper than just ignorance, and this is deeper than just people not knowing how to solve a problem. Now, I, what I will say, in as dark a view as I have of the executive committee uh, and, and what has happened here, I'm encouraged 
in the sense that this investigation never would have happened if grassroots Southern Baptists hadn't shown up at the convention and demanded it happen and, and, and demanded it happen and go around much of their leadership to do that. And so um, we'll see uh, what happens in the days to come. But maybe finally uh, the people in the pews are, are ready to say enough of this. What should happen now? It's 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 hard for me to say uh, what can happen in, in such a short period of time, given the crisis and how long it has taken to, to get here. But there needs to be accountability for the leaders uh, who've been involved in this. Uh, there needs to be a restitution uh, for those who have been harmed. Uh, during this uh, this awful process, um, that there needs to be a a taking away of the kind of power and the kind of authority that could allow this sort of thing to go on unchecked, and with it the kind of culture of intimidation and retaliation, not just against uh, the sexual abuse survivors, not just those that we see uh, in this report, but also for those who who would advocate for them or who would uh, whistleblow. That has to happen. And the agenda being set uh, within the denomination by a small group of people who wish to act uh, as, uh, as political power brokers and sometimes almost a mafia, that, that has to be addressed. And there are a lot of sweet and good and Christ-like people, uh, most of them in the pews uh, are. But they have to realize that this is happening and to say, not in, not in our name anymore. And that means not blaming the people who say that there's a problem, but blaming the problem and fixing the problem. In response to the report, the current president of the Southern Baptist Convention, Ed Litton, said in a statement that there are not adequate words to express my sorrow at the things revealed in this report and that the Southern Baptists must resolve to change our culture and implement desperately needed reforms. Do you believe him? Uh, do I believe Ed? Yes, because yeah. Ed's, Ed's been uh, Ed's been speaking and working on these issues uh, for a long time. Uh, but Ed can't do it alone. He knows that. Uh, that's, that's going to take, uh, it, and it can't be done through these just trust us. It's going to take a long time, sort of a blue ribbon committee approach. It's been 20 years of this. And so uh, this, this needs action now and not any more delay. And I think Ed is, is completely sincere in, uh, in seeing that that happens. Uh, everybody else needs to join him as well. And J.D. Greer, who was the president right before him, also was heroic in trying to address this. And he uh, like many of us, faced obstacle after stonewall after stonewall uh, here, and that that needs to end. Uh, these these uh, these lone uh, leaders who are speaking to this, along with the army of sexual abuse survivors and their advocates out there, none of these people can do it on their own. There needs to be a a driving away from apathy for everybody to deal with it. These were issues that you had been dealing with for quite some time. These, the, these issues, the convention's failure to respond to them appropriately were, were among the reasons you resigned. Also, the harassment directed at you because you kept pushing on this issue was, were among the reasons you resigned. And I, I just have to ask, even though you knew about some of these things, what was your reaction when you read the report, when you saw all this written down in, in black and white? I was physically repulsed. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I, I had physical reactions. I, I broke out into hives um, that I've had to have uh, treated. Uh, and and what, what that caused me to, to wonder is what is the response of, I've talked to many sexual abuse uh, advisors, uh, sexual abuse survivors who have had a very difficult time uh, reading this report, far worse than anything I could imagine. And I have to wonder about those uh, out there in the country who don't feel that they have any voice or any power at all, what their response must be to, to reading this. And it's, it's gut-wrenching. Do you have any regret about leaving, feeling like perhaps you could be part of this change? Or do you feel that if you had not left, that perhaps the change would not have come? I have no regrets, uh, although I have great pain. I, I, was, I was raised with my entire identity tied up in being a Southern Baptist. And um, it's, it, it's, it's almost impossible to think of myself as, uh, as anything other than a Southern Baptist, but I had to. 
and uh, and there there was there was no other way that I could carry out the calling that Jesus had, had given to me. I couldn't do what they wanted me to do, and I couldn't be who they wanted me to be. But do you? I remember you writing at one point that your wife said, "Look, I love you. I'm with you to the end. But if you don't leave, you're going to be in an interfaith marriage." Yes, she had Which seen it, too much. She'd seen too much. Yes, she, she was with me along with my son uh, at an executive committee meeting because after uh, so many of these, uh, so many of these attacks on on at various fronts from there, my son, uh, fifteen years old, had asked her, "Hey, has Dad had some sort of a moral failure?" Uh, and so I said, "Why don't you come with me and 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 just listen to it all?" And he did. And then when we left, he just said, "Dad." Why do we want to be a part of this? Now, you know, that, that was really a, a big moment for both of us. We had to leave. A lot of people have had to leave uh, 1.1 million people over the last three years. That said, uh, I don't expect anybody else to leave. And I don't judge uh, the people who are staying uh, just as I would hope they wouldn't judge uh, me for leaving. We need people to stay and to work for reform. Uh, and we also need people to say, uh, sometimes when there's a, a what I consider to be a toxic environment, I have to leave it in order to be faithful to who they taught me to be. Is there anything that would cause you to go back? I don't think so. Um, but, um, but that doesn't mean that I don't, um, that I don't pray and hope that they get this right. I, I wish that I had been wrong on, on, um, on what I concluded. And I really, really hope that, uh, over the next uh, year and the next several years, we look back and say, uh, th they're doing the right thing. That, that's my hope. Pastor Russell Moore, thank you so much for talking with us once again. Thank you. Thank you.